God bless you, everyone. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 29. Acts, chapter 29. We're going to finish our series today called Awake. We've been walking together through the book of Acts, and uh, we're going to finish it. Acts, chapter 29. While you find your way there, uh, a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. Oh, why not? <laughs> Your faces are priceless. You're, you're like, great. You're like looking at the screen. You're looking around. <laughs> there is no chapter 29. So let's bunt. Let's read the last two verses uh, of chapter 28. And let's hear the closing words to the book of Acts. Acts 28. And look at the very end, verse 30 and 31. It says, For two whole years, Paul stayed in Rome in his own rented house. And he welcomed all who came to see him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, boldly and unhindered. What will they say about you when your life is over? What will they write about you in your obituary? What will be the summary of your life? What qualities will you be remembered for? What life accomplishments will be credited to you? Frederick Clark's family wrote this about his life. Fred lost his, ba his battle as a result of an automobile accident on June 18th. During his lifetime, he excelled at mediocrity. He had a lifelong love affair with bacon, butter, cigars, and bourbon. People always knew what Fred was thinking, much to the dismay of his friends and family. His son said of Fred, he was often wrong, but never in doubt. He died at MCV Hospital and sadly was deprived of his final wish, which was for he and his wife to go on a double date with Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter to crash an ACLU cocktail party. <laughs> the daughter of Dolores Aguilar wrote this. Dolores Aguilar has left us. Dolores had no hobbies, made no contribution to society, and rarely shared a kind word or deed in her life. I speak for the majority of her family when I say her presence will not be missed by many. Very few tears will be shed, and there will be no lamenting over her passing. There will be no services, no prayers, and no closure for her family, which she tore apart her entire life. Come to think of it, maybe you should write your own obituary ahead of time. <laughs> a man named Louis Casimir did. He was an English professor, and he left this obituary for his family to fill in the dates and publish. Louis J. Casimir Jr. bought the farm on Thursday, February 5th. Having lived more than twice as long as he expected, and probably three or four times as long as he deserved. Although he was born into an impecunious family in a backward and benighted part of the country at the beginning of the Great Depression, he never in his life suffered any real hardships. Many of his childhood friends who weren't killed or maimed in various wars became petty criminals and or Republicans. <laughs> Lou was a daredevil. His last words were, watch this. When your life is over, what will they write about you? Since September, we've been on a journey through the book of Acts together. Acts is the story of the long, difficult journey of the gospel from the upper room in Jerusalem to the heart of the Roman Empire. In fact, the harrowing sea voyage in Acts chapter 27 is in its own way a picture of the entire book of Acts. The steady advance of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome in spite of every kind of difficulty imaginable. Our journey has spanned 30 years from Jesus' ascension to Paul's appeal to Caesar. Acts chapter 28 gives us our last earthly glimpse of Paul. He's under house arrest in Rome, awaiting trial before Emperor Nero. He's chained to a special forces soldier, sewing tents and preaching his heart out. But Luke's words run out before the story plays out. Luke doesn't tell us how it ended. 
He doesn't tell us what was the outcome of Paul's trial or, or what became of Paul and his companions. This is really no ending at all. The words just stop giving us no closure. Where is chapter 29? But perhaps Luke is trying to make a point. The story of the gospel and of the church isn't over yet. We are chapter 29. We are the ending of the story. We are the ones who will finish what began in an upper room in Jerusalem. Acts 29 is our story to write. It's my story to write and your story to write. And how will the story end? How will the mission of the gospel end? How will the story of the church end? More specifically, how will your story end? What will be the final summary of your life written in the annals of heaven? No matter how or where you started, no matter what obstacles you encountered along the way, no matter what detours you might have taken, how will the end of your life read? What risks will you take for the sake of Christ and his kingdom? What adventures will the gospel take you on? What mighty exploits will the Holy Spirit perform through you? Beyond the book of Acts, church history only gives us a few scant details about the rest of Paul's life. We can't be certain what happened to him, but we can be certain about how Paul finished his race. Luke summarized Paul's life with one final word, unhindered. That's the very last word of the book of Acts. For two whole years, Paul rented his own house. He preached the kingdom of God. He taught about the lordship of Jesus Christ confidently, boldly, and unhindered. Unhindered. How on earth could Luke say that Paul was unhindered? He was under house arrest. In fact, he had been in prison for, for over four years now. He was physically chained to a soldier 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Paul ate his meals shackled to a soldier. He, he slept shackled to a soldier. He, he prayed shackled to a soldier. He, he wrote letters to the Philippians and Philemon and the Colossians and the Ephesians shackled to a soldier. He preached and he taught shackled to a soldier. I don't know about you, but I would regard that as just a bit of a hindrance. So here's what we must realize. Unhindered doesn't mean unopposed. Unhindered doesn't mean unobstructed. It doesn't mean uncontested. No, unhindered means undeterred. Come hell or high water. Unhindered means unstoppable. Unhindered means uncontainable, irrepressible. It means incorrigible. Unhindered means indomitable. Looking at the very last words of the book of Acts, I find three ways in which Paul was undeterred. And as you write your story, as you finish chapter 29, may heaven write these three things about you too. Chapter 29. May heaven write these three things about you. First of all, may heaven write about you that you never stopped loving. May heaven write about you that you never stopped loving. The last picture that we have of Paul is of a man who was hopelessly in love with people. Do you know, from the very first day, the gospel and the church faced fierce opposition in the world. Down on the street, right under the windows of the upper room, the followers of Jesus were mocked at 9 o'clock in the morning. They were called drunkards and out of their minds. The followers of Jesus were arrested in the temple and interrogated and threatened. They were arrested again and again, imprisoned, tried before kangaroo courts and flogged. Stephen was stoned to death outside the city gate. 
and brutal persecution broke out against the church. Temple police went from synagogue to synagogue and from house to house, dragging away both men and women followers of Jesus and stoning them to death. James the disciple, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, was beheaded and Peter was arrested with the same intent, but God had another idea. From the very beginning, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, but no one suffered more for the sake of Christ than Paul. Paul wrote, I have been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again five times. I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned to death. I've been in danger from bandits. I've been in danger from my own countrymen. I've been in danger from Gentiles. I've been in danger from false Christian brothers. I've been in danger of riots in the city and in danger of ambush in the country. They even tried to feed me to the lions at Ephesus. But beloved, listen to me. This is what I want you to catch. In spite of everything that Paul had suffered at the hands of people, he never gave up on the human race. In spite of all that he had suffered at the hands of the Jews, he never gave up on his own Jewish people. Right to the very end, in Acts chapter 28, Paul was reaching out to the Jewish community in Rome with the gospel. And when the Jewish leaders rejected him corporately, he went right on reaching out to Jewish people individually. Paul welcomed all who came to see him. Paul remained open to people. He was unhindered. It's not that he was unopposed by people, but that he was undeterred in his love for for people nevertheless. He simply refused to stop loving. And Paul didn't just tolerate people, he actually enjoyed people. He lingered with people all day, and sometimes all day and all night. People weren't just a means to an end, people were the end. Their eternal salvation, their growth and maturity in Jesus Christ, their health and well-being, their peace and their joy. Do you know, Paul wasn't always that way. Acts chapter 9 says that the old Paul had killer breath. Criticism and verbal abuse, he spewed curses and threats and death wishes. The old Paul was self-righteous. The old Paul was arrogant and judgmental, but something happened when Paul met Jesus. He had a transforming encounter with mercy. He had a transforming encounter with forgiveness and grace and the love of God. Something happened when Paul saw God's love manifested through other mature believers. He never forgot how Stephen went out with his face shining like an angel, interceding as Jesus had for those who were stoning him. Father, forgive them. He never forgot how his friend and mentor Barnabas went out restoring bratty little John Mark who abandoned them in Turkey and then ran home to Jerusalem and made all kinds of trouble for him. Paul's experience with Jesus and his experience with mature, loving believers had changed him. Beloved, as you write your chapter 29, as you write the end of your story, may heaven say about you that you never stop loving people all the way to the end. May heaven write that your love was undeterred. Unhindered doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred love, regardless of what people do to you. Never stop regarding people as intrinsically and infinitely valuable. Never stop seeing people as made in the image of God. Never stop seeing the potential in Christ of every life that you encounter. Never stop seeing before you an immortal soul for whom Christ died who will spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. Unhindered doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred in your love, regardless of what people do to you. 
never stop paying the high cost of loving people for Jesus' sake. Luke says here that Paul rented a house at his own expense. It cost Paul to provide a place where he could receive people and share the gospel with them. The implication is that Paul sewed tents with his hands shackled in order to make it possible for him to host people. It costs something to love people for Jesus' sake. It costs your time. It costs your effort. It costs your money. May you never stop regarding people as worth whatever personal sacrifices you must make to show them that Jesus loves them. Unhindered, it doesn't mean unopposed. It means that you're undeterred in your love. Regardless of what people do to you, never stop opening your hearts to them. Never stop making yourself vulnerable. Never stop taking risks with your heart. Never stop turning the other cheek. You know, that can be very hard to do sometimes. When Denise and I first moved here to be the associate pastors in 1996, I was 29 and Denise was 27. We were married for one year. We had just finished putting ourselves through seminary. We hoped to start a family right away, but things didn't go quite as we planned it. Nothing was really happening on the baby front. And people in the church would ask us all the time, when are you going to start a family? When are you going to have kids? And we would just smile and say, oh, in God's time. Meanwhile, we were in pain. Along the way, Denise had a couple of early miscarriages. There was a, a lovely couple here at harvest time from the very beginning. They were on their way home from vacation down south, and as they were driving past Philadelphia, the husband had a heart attack behind the wheel of the car. They rushed him to the hospital in Philly where he went in the ICU, and Denise and I drove down to be with them. And while we were in the waiting room of the cardiac ICU, Denise miscarried. She started bleeding, and she almost fainted in my arms. And I was there with a couple from my church in distress in the ICU and my wife in distress in my arms out in the waiting room. In January of 1999, when the congregation voted on us to become the senior pastors, out of 150-something votes that were cast, there was only one no vote. And the woman who cast the no vote told us why. She felt, said that she felt that we weren't qualified to be senior pastors because we didn't have any children. Wow. I have to tell you that we've heard some hurtful things. I know you have too, but that one was hard. What did she know about our private pain? What did she know about our, our four years of prayers to God for a child? What did she know about that awful day when I had one of my sheep dying in the ICU and my wife passing out in my arms in the waiting room two and a half hours away from home from any help? After the 5.30 p.m. service last night, I came out to learn the tragic news that Pastor Rick Warren's son took his own life on Friday. I've had the privilege of meeting Pastor Rick on several occasions. I have to tell you the truth, he's one of the most beautiful, genuine, spirit-filled men that I have ever met. And all this nonsense about him advocating Chrislam is just pure poppycock. I went on one of the news sites and quite predictably there were hundreds of cruel comments. Some from atheists who asked where is the God that he worshipped and prayed to now. Some comments from gay rights activists who speculated that it was due to the atmosphere of repression in his home that this young man took his life. There were even some cruel comments from Christians who said it was God's punishment for the watered-down gospel that he preached. Beloved, sometimes the human capacity for cruelty is absolutely astounding. And moments like that, they, they make us want to pull back from people. 
They make us want to run for cover. They make us want to close ourselves off and protect ourselves. We become distrustful and defensive. One of our counseling professors at the seminary used to say, someone can only poke you in the eye so many times before you can't bring yourself to get close to them anymore. And it's true. Some people even go so far as to make vows, resolutions. No one will ever make me cry again. And they can't cry. Yet in spite of everything that Paul had suffered at the hands of both the Jews and the Gentiles, he welcomed all who came to see him undeterred. Paul never gave up. Paul never stopped trying. He never stopped loving the man who had been stoned to death outside of the city gate of Lystra and prayed back to life again. The man who had been fed to the lions at Ephesus. The man who had been beaten and unjustly imprisoned time and time again. That man wrote these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love always protects, always believes the best, always hopes for the best, always perseveres. Love never fails. In his letter to the Romans, Paul revealed the secret of this undeterred love. He said, God has lavishly poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. Beloved, can I tell you this ability to love undeterred, it comes only from God. It comes from loving Him. It comes from being loved by Him. And it's the ability to love others like Him. Chapter 29. May heaven write three things about you. May heaven write that you never stop loving. And second, may heaven write that you never stopped believing. The last picture that we have of Paul is of a man of unwavering faith in God. Luke says Paul preached the kingdom of God and he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence undeterred. You know, not only did Paul face opposition from people, but some days, many days, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Over the last 15 years, we sure have had our share of disasters when we've planned big events. I remember the weekend that we moved into this building in December of 2003. It was our 20th anniversary, and we had a huge weekend planned. We had a concert on Friday night and a big banquet on Saturday night and services on Sunday. And we had not one, but we had two back-to-back snowstorms on Friday and on Saturday that just wiped out the entire weekend. We're having our 30th anniversary uh, in December of this year. I think Israel Houghton, the new breed, might be with us for a concert. So you better start praying now that the weather is going to be good. We've had church picnics that got scorched out. We've had outdoor water baptisms with thunder and lightning overhead. We've had harvest parties that have been snowed out in October. Last October, Superstorm Sandy blew away the harvest party, and then on the backup rain date, we had a snowstorm. (laughs) We've had Easter eggs, hunts rained out. Did you ever notice in the winter, it always snows on a Saturday night? And if it's not Saturday night, it's Wednesday night. It's the devil. (laughs) There are some days that I just lift my face to heaven. And I say, God, I am trying to do your work. Could you just work with me? (laughs) Now, just think about poor old Paul. He wrote, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been in danger from rivers. I've often gone without food and water. I've been cold and naked. No wonder that he battled so many sicknesses. In Israel, Paul became the prisoner of the crooked governor Felix, who only detained him for two years because he was hoping to get a bribe. When Felix lost his job, he left Paul in prison just for spite. And then the novice Festus took over. 
And because Festus was willing to transfer Paul back to Jerusalem where the Jews planned to murder him, Paul had to appeal to Caesar. You want to talk about a comedy of errors. On the sea voyage to Rome, Paul gave them a prophetic warning not to venture out of the winter harbor. And then a soft breeze started blowing from the south, made Paul look like an idiot. Really, Lord? Then the ship was caught in a violent hurricane. It ran aground. The waves battered the ship to pieces. They all made it to shore, clinging to the broken boards. And when they lit a fire on the shore to get warm, a viper came out of the wood and bit Paul on the hands. It's like my friend Mr. Seppi says, if he didn't have bad luck, he would have no luck at all. <laughs> Yet Paul's confidence in God was undeterred. He had un wavering faith in the sovereignty of God. Paul was absolutely convinced that he was in God's hand and that no amount of opposition that he faced in this life could possibly thwart God's plan. When the ship was pitching up and down on monstrous waves and the soldiers and the sailors and the cellmates were in despair of their lives, Paul said, be of good cheer. I believe God and it shall be just as he promised me. Shackled to a soldier in Rome, Paul wrote to the Philippians, I want you to know, brothers, that everything that has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Unhindered, it doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred in faith. Beloved, listen, whatever befalls you in life, never stop trusting in the sovereignty of God. May God give you the grace to look at the story of your life through his eyes. Paul could have given in to self-pity. If only Felix hadn't been such a greedy crook. If only Festus hadn't been such a political novice. I wouldn't have to spend four years in jail. I wouldn't have to be here in Rome shackled to a soldier. But Paul was undeterred by self-pity. Instead, he saw the hand of God in every circumstance. He wrote to the Philippians, I've preached to the whole Praetorian Guard. Members of Caesar's own household have become followers of Jesus, and the believers in Rome have been encouraged to speak the word of God boldly and courageously because I'm here. Paul was irrepressible. His spirit was indomitable. Paul said, I may be in chains, but I can still pray for my sheep. I may be in chains, but I can still write letters. I may be in chains, but I can still witness to visitors. I may be bound, but the word and the work of God is never bound. Yeah. Beloved, as you look at the story of your own life, May God help you to see his hand through all the twists and turns, through all the mishaps, through all the comedies of errors. May you see that God has led you to places that you never planned to go and he's positioned you to minister to people that you never expected to reach. May you have incorrigible hope. May you have irrepressible faith. May you have an indomitable spirit. After all of these things, Paul wrote these words, and we know this, that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. What shall we say to all of these things? If God be for me, who can be against me? What shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword? No, in all of these things, I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. Unhindered. It doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred in your faith. Never stop believing in God's sovereignty and never stop believing in the power of His gospel. In spite of all the rejections, Paul was undeterred in his faith in the supernatural power of the gospel. It is an inherently powerful message. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to those who believe. He preached the kingdom of God and he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with confidence. 
The Jewish leaders in Rome corporately rejected the gospel, but Paul went right on confidently witnessing to individuals. And some of the Jews believed. To the others, Paul said, God's salvation has been to the, sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. May God fill you with that same spirit of faith to believe that this message is inherently powerful. And whenever you tell your story, people will listen. They will respond. They will believe. They will awaken from spiritual death. They will be released from the grip of the enemy. And they will experience radical spiritual transformation. Beloved, believe and never stop believing in the sovereignty of God and the power of His Word. Amen. Chapter 29. May heaven write three things about you. May heaven write that you never stop loving. May heaven write that you never stop believing. And finally, may heaven write that you never stop speaking boldly that you never stop speaking boldly. The last picture that we have of Paul is of a man who refused to be silent no matter what the consequences. For two whole years, Paul stayed in Rome under house arrest at his own expense, welcoming all those who came to see him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ boldly and unhindered. Beloved, not only was it very costly for Paul to rent a house so that he could preach the gospel, it was also very, very risky. The Jews in Rome were walking on eggshells. Just a few years earlier, the emperor Claudius had banished the entire Jewish population from the city of Rome because they wouldn't stop rioting over Jesus Christ. When Paul called the Jewish leaders together and began to talk about Jesus, they gave him the hand. They said, Paul, we don't want to know nothing about nothing. Paul was stirring up the hornet's nest again. It would have been much wiser for him to just keep his head down until his trial was over so that he could keep his head on. But Paul couldn't stay quiet. He said, I am compelled to preach the gospel. Woe, to, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Church tradition tells us that after two years under arrest, Paul was acquitted. It says that he traveled for four more years to the westernmost part of the Roman Empire preaching the gospel. He was rearrested. And he was imprisoned in Rome where he wrote his final letters, including 2 Timothy. Finally, he was executed by the emperor Nero around 66 or 67 AD. That's all the details that we have. But we do know that Paul never stopped speaking boldly. Beloved, everybody look at me. It's critically important that we understand that unhindered doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred. Very quickly, the gospel is becoming labeled in America as hate speech. Evangelical Christians are being classified as religious extremists. There were some training materials for the U.S. military exposed last week in which evangelical Christians are lumped with members of Al-Qaeda as religious extremists. Listen, you can keep your head in your sand if you want to, but I'm telling you, it's on like Donkey Kong. Biblical morality is considered a violation of people's civil liberties. As opposition increases, may we finish like Paul, Undeterred in speaking boldly. Unhindered doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred in your witness for Jesus. In spite of opposition, never stop speaking boldly about the kingship of God. Never stop telling people that there is a God in heaven who made 
the world and everything in it, who is the king of the universe. Never stop telling people that he is knowable, that he has a distinct identity, that he's revealed to us in the Bible. Never stop telling people that he is the giver and the sustainer of every life and the giver of every good blessing. Never stop telling people that because he is the creator, he has the right of ownership and leadership over everything and over everyone. Unhindered doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred in your witness. In spite of opposition, never stop speaking boldly about the resurrection of the dead. One of the central messages of the book of Acts is the resurrection. The book opens with Jesus' resurrection. And it ends in Acts 28 with Paul speaking about the hope of Israel. That is the resurrection of the dead to be forever in heaven with God because of Jesus. All the way through the book of Acts, the message is that one day there will be a resurrection of all the dead, both the righteous and the wicked. The righteous in Christ will take their inheritance in his eternal kingdom. The wicked will go off into eternal punishment, into the fire that was designed for the devil and for his demons. Beloved, I want to tell you, that is not hate speech. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is the words of Jesus himself. The most unloving thing that you could ever do is to withhold that critical message from someone. The most loving thing that you could ever do is plead with people in every way to accept the offer of God's salvation while there's still time. The secular world has it all upside down. What they regard as hate, Jesus called love. What they regard as love, Jesus called hate. If I saw someone in a crosswalk and a bus was barreling down the street toward him, What kind of evil person would I be if I stood on the safety of the sidewalk and I did absolutely nothing? Well, I don't want to shout out and startle him. Don't want to give him a fright. It's noisy here uh, on this city street. He probably won't hear me shouting anyway. Perhaps he wants to get hit by the bus. Perhaps it's his fate to get hit by the bus. What person in his right mind in that situation wouldn't jump up and down and wave his arms and holler and do everything he could just to warn and say, look out of the way, get out of the way, you're in danger. And if we would certainly do that to save a man's earthly life, which is merely a vapor that appears and then vanishes, how much more should we speak up boldly to save a man's soul which will live for all of eternity? We've become so enamored with new revelation that we've forgotten that the most important revelation of all is the hope of eternal life in heaven because of Jesus Christ. Unhindered doesn't mean unopposed. It means undeterred. In spite of opposition, never stop speaking boldly about the lordship of Jesus Christ. Pastor Jason, you can come. Never stop speaking boldly about the lordship of Jesus Christ. Beloved, never stop telling people that Christianity is consistent with everything that God has done since the beginning of time. There is only one true religion. It's the religion of the Bible. It's the religion that began with Adam, that continued with Abraham and Moses and David and culminated in Jesus Christ and is carried today by his church. Never stop telling people that Jesus is the unique son of God, Israel's Messiah, and the one and only savior of the world. Never stop telling people that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Then it will be too late to choose him. 
our choice will already have been sealed. Either we received Jesus as Lord or we rejected him. Some people have decided not to make a decision about Jesus. But a decision not to make a decision is a decision. The decision not to receive him now is the decision to reject him for all of eternity. Everybody look at me. Unhindered. It doesn't mean unopposed in life. It means undeterred. Whatever men do to you, whatever comedy of errors befall you, whatever curveballs life throws at you, whatever the devil and all the demons of hell bring against you, don't you ever quit. What will they write about you when your story is over? May heaven write about you that you never stop loving, that you never stop believing, and that you never stop speaking boldly for Jesus' sake. Stand on your feet this morning, and I want you to give Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, it's a little weak. We can do a little better than that. Come on, let's worship Jesus. Let's give him a big praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift up your voice. I have decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow no turning back. Come on. I have decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow no turning back no the world back. behind me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross No turning back, no turning back. Let's have a little fun. Let's make up some words of our own. This is always a little dangerous when I try this, but let's try it. Let's sing this. Though men oppose me, still I will love them. Can you do it? Let's try that. Though men oppose me, still I will love them. Though men oppose me, Till I will love them, though men oppose me, still I will love them. No turning back, no turning back. No, no come on, one more time. Back. I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow. To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Come on, give the Lord one more big praise in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you just lift up your hands to heaven, lift up your face to the Lord, and let me pray for you right now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for the people of God. Father, I pray that holy courage, holy boldness, holy strength 
would fill your people. I pray that we'd be strengthened in our innermost being with strength that comes from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd bring us into remembrance of all the words of Jesus so that our thinking would become aligned with the truth of Scripture. Lord, as we face assaults constantly against our faith, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would make us uh, uh, strong, that we'd have a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind, that the words of Jesus would ring in our ears. Father, I pray no matter what people might say or do, no matter how they might hurt us, that God, we would never stop loving. Lord, that we'd never stop trying that we'd never stop seeing people as intrinsically and infinitely valuable, that we'd never stop paying the high cost of loving them for your sake, that we'd remain open in our hearts, vulnerable, that you'd help us turn the other cheek when we've been insulted, Jesus. God, may heaven write about us that we never stop loving. May heaven write about us that we never stop believing. In spite of the challenges, in spite of life's curveballs, in spite of the comedy of errors, the things that befall us, in spite of the storms. Father, I pray that you'd give us unwavering faith in your sovereignty. Trust in the grip of your hand. Trust that no opposition from hell or from men or from the storms of life could possibly thwart your good plan for us. Give us faith in the power of the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. Father, I pray that no matter what opposition we face, we would be undeterred in speaking boldly for you. God, I pray that irresistible grace would be on our lips. The same grace that rested on the lips of Jesus and Peter and Stephen and Paul. God, let it be upon our lips, Lord. God, I pray that you'd help us to boldly declare the kingship of God, the resurrection of the dead, and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that heaven's annals would record about us that we lived our lives unhindered. Take the hand of someone next to you now. We're going to dismiss as soon as we do. If you're new